Hello, and welcome to the Lunatics Radio Hour podcast. I'm Abby Branker. I'm here with Alan Kudan. Hello. And today, we're talking about the Kraken. The Kraken. Everyone's, I mean, I, I'm sorry, I was about to say everyone's favorite sea monster, but uh, I don't, you know, that's that's a very personal choice. Is it your favorite sea monster? No. <laughs> okay. Who's your favorite sea monster? So, okay, fine. So if I had to pick a favorite sea monster, it would probably be the Leviathan. Okay. But that that's a that's a whole loaded statement, you know? Mm-hmm. Cuz like what is the Leviathan? Is it are we talking about like the Leviathan from the Bible? Cuz that's not super fun. And or just like what is the description of that? If you like look into like the mythos, it's like this giant like serpent dragon water thing. It's like no, I just want a really 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 big sea monster that is in all tentacles. You don't like the tentacles. It's not that I don't like I I You think they're overdone. I love the tentacles. Okay. I think they're incredible. Okay. <laughs> I don't I like when the tentacles are just the first thing that you see, but the real thing is even bigger. Okay. You know? Right. So like the D and D Kraken. Yeah. That's a that's a pretty good one. Well, he's got all these tentacles and stuff, but his actual body is still like huge. You know what is it? Just a blob? Well, let's 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 pull up a quick reference image. He so, looks like a sea dragon with tentacles at the end. This yeah. guy, yeah. The thing that I don't like is when they're just an enormous octopus. I just, I think, you know, an an octopus is a friend, not a foe. I think though, when you look back at the origins of the kraken, it makes sense. It does. It's just historically, not, it's there. just not my preferred. Okay. I didn't realize you had such strong personal Correct. opinions. I have a lot of personal opinions about the kraken when it comes to sea monsters okay well maybe there's more to explore here i mean yeah that's why we're here all right let's get into today's sources we have wikipedia a storied video from youtube an ars technica article which we actually pull a lot of quotes out of so thank you ars technica for this research a live science article and a film school rejects article by kevin carr also a lot of movies That's as specific as you want to get? Yeah. Okay. I mean, we'll talk about the movies as we go. I also don't remember them until I'm in the moment. (laughs) Oh, good. In 2013, Japanese researchers captured footage of a giant squid on film for the very first time. Wait, we're just jumping into this? What do you want to say? I mean, I thought we were doing some sweeping statements about sea monsters still. You go first. (laughs) They scare me. Oh, yeah? Yeah. What about them? I don't like tentacles. They scare me. They're slimy. They're creepy. I don't like to eat animals with tentacles. Okay. That's my broad... So I'm not interested in consuming a kraken. That's my broad statement. I, well, I would have to do some research before eating a kraken. I personally will not eat an octopus. Not because the tentacles freak me out. But because fact, they're smart. In fact, they're quite delicious. Yeah. But yes, they're very, very smart. So you only want to eat dumb animals. Mm. That's your that's your uh, philosophy. It's not that I want to eat dumb animals. <laughs> uh-huh. It's that animals are really delicious. Mm-hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. It, and I have to have some morals. Have I, you ever had a human? No. No. Oh. So I won't eat anything that's an octopus <laughs> okay they're just they're just too smart you know they have feelings mm-hmm. they are just wild wild creatures i was actually just reading up on like octopus breeding habits of uh, course of course you were why why because i i saw this picture of somebody they were in a like a, like a tide pool type area sure and they lifted up a rock and there's all these little octopus eggs hanging from the bottom of it and you could see in the bottom of the tide pool was the mama octopus, just like, you know, tr- trying to guard the eggs. But like giant, you know, flesh human comes and flesh human p- picks it up and like, you know, octopus is scared and you feel bad for the little octopus. Then I started like read up, like, does she just like sit with them the whole time? And the answer is yes. After laying the eggs, she will literally never leave them. She will starve to death right at like she will just live off her own reserves, completely stops eating. Never, like, unless something, like, wanders within grabbing range. 
But even it gets to a certain point where she's like, I have to focus on watching these so intensely that I can't even eat, even the food's right in front of me. Isn't that crazy? What is the dad doing this whole time? Uh, This is also a bit of a scientific mystery. So after mating, the male shortly dies. (laughs) I like it. Well, the, it makes sense for the female because she's just so captivated by watching over the eggs that she starves to death. The male just like, he's lived his purpose. I guess so. So I, I started doing some research and apparently there's a specialized organ in the middle of their heads that secretes, I don't know, whatever it is, hormones, enzymes, whatever it is that just controls uh, maternal behavior. Mm -hmm. And like scientists have like tried removing that. And then suddenly the octopus mom stops watching over eggs, starts eating, then lives a super long life. Otherwise they live just like one or two years. Weird. Interesting. Certainly it seems like there's a lot of evolution within that species to breed I wonder also if male octopi would like eat their eggs or something, and that's why they've evolved to die immediately. Can't be trusted. The mama octopus will get so hungry that she'll nibble on her own tentacles. Oh, that's so sad. Imagine nibbling off your own fingers just because you're so hungry while you're watching over your children. It's it's literally just like um, that statue of Ugolino in the Met. Have you seen this thing? No. That was when... Uh, he, this guy got sentenced to, well, sentenced to death by just getting locked into a tower with all of his children. And so everyone was just going to starve to death. Everyone is just dying of starvation and he's going absolutely ravenous with hunger. And like the children are clinging to him being like, we're so hungry. We're so hungry. And meanwhile, he's just like starting to gnaw off his own fingers. So he doesn't like eat his kids. Wow. It's intense. Very intense. Yeah. Do you know any squid facts? I don't really care about squids. Okay, well, squids are going to be a big part of our conversation today, so I need you to change that attitude a little bit. I imagine they would be. I have no problem eating squids. Why? Because they're stupid. I, I, I don't know about that. That I feel like in a squid... Okay. Okay, so let's hear in, it. In a squid and octopus Jeopardy match, who do you think is going to win? Neither. D- no. They can't press the buzzer. Oct- Excuse me. An octopus is incredibly smart. They can absolutely use tools. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. So the octopus will win. Also, calamari is delicious. I hate calamari. <laughs> no, I've never had it. I won't eat it. I can't do it. You've never had it? No. Oh, wow. Ugh. We're going to trick you. No, you're not. Your <laughs> I, will not. I will not. I read that the little calamari rings, like, you, you know how when you are getting imitation crab you're usually getting like the same it's always like the same like white fish or something Mm -hmm. well i read that oftentimes calamari and like not even not like super fancy restaurants is uh, a pig pig butthole you read that yeah and so i immediately started googling around being like is this true have i really been enjoying pig butthole this entire time oh my god and and the, you have been. The answer is, fortunately, Snopes got to the bottom of this one, and it is just an urban legend. Well, did you know that there's all of this drama right now because of the Subway tuna? No, what's that? You know, the Subway tuna sandwich? I love the Subway tuna I know. sandwich. They've done all of these tests at different <laughs> Subways, and they're coming back 0% tuna. What? There's been like one that came back like a, a low percentage tuna, but most of the majority of them come back a zero percentage tuna in like FDA tests around what it is. What? It, what is it? I don't know. Like other things. Uh, thank you. But what? <laughs> what? Subway's tuna is not tuna, but a mixture of, end quote, various concoctions, a lawsuit alleges. This is a story on WashingtonPost.com. That it does. Ex- we found that the ingredients were not tuna and not fish. The attorney said in an email to the Washington Post. Not fish. The fuck is it? Quoting: Saving substantial sums of money in manufacturing the products because the fabricated ingredients they use in the place of tuna cost less money. Consumers are consistently misled into purchasing the products for the commonly known and or advertised benefits and characteristics of tuna, which, in fact, no such benefits could be had, given that the products are, in fact, devoid of tuna, the lawsuit claims. First and foremost, anyone who is eating 
Subway tuna for the health benefits is sorely misinformed or delusional or both, whether there's actual tuna in there or not. I have it on good authority from a former certified Subway sandwich artist. Okay. Tuna, tuna legitimacy aside, the amount of mayonnaise that gets mixed in with the quote unquote tuna already is astronomically high. Oh my God, yeah. And so when people come in and then ask like for mayonnaise on top of the sandwich, this former Subway sandwich artist would just inwardly just be dying. Well, so I guess there's no squid in there either. Apparently there's no seafood, which that's just mind blowing. It's just... What is it? I know there's lots of mayonnaise, but like what's the rest? It could be chicken, right? You feel like it's similar in consistency. I mean, tuna is the chicken of the sea. There you go. And Subway is the liar of the sandwich franchises. That's not true. They all lie. All of them? Most of them. Jersey Mike's? Who's that? (laughs) It's a sandwich place. I don't know it. All right, well. Okay, we are here to talk horror history. And so far, the only horrific things we've been talking about is like what goes into popular food. And self-cannibalism. Oh, yeah, and self-cannibalism. I mean, that's pretty horrifying. You you earlier were very uh, surprised by how much I've thought about the Kraken. Or just how much, you know, my, my opinions on the Kraken in general. And this actually stems from a pretty early age. Some of my very first fears, like phobias, were of sea monsters. I, I used to have this recurring... It's like a, it, I don't know. I would just freak myself out with this image. It wasn't even just like a night. It wasn't even a nightmare. It would just happen during the day. But I would just imagine just being out on open water. It's just like glassy surface, no horizon in sight, or sorry, no shore in sight. And you just see this little, little thing poke out of the water, just very small. And then you put your face under the water and then you can just see this sprawling something. It's horrifying. So the thing that scares you most is also the thing that you want in a in a sea monster, a huge, huge sea monster. Yes. That, I mean, the, isn't that the appeal of horror in general? Like, why would people want to get scared? The adrenaline. So that's it. I'm an adrenaline The dopamine. Junkie. But uh, if you really want to break this down, it comes from megalophobia. So the fear of insanely large things and thalassophobia which is just the fear of the unknown of water. So whether that is when you can't see the bottom or it's just, you know, open seas, that's thalassophobia. I think we've talked about this on either ghost ships or Loch Ness Monster or something, because I remember you saying like big ships where the hull is so deeply underwater freak you out too, right? Yes. So that would be mixing in submechophobia, which is man-made objects underwater when they shouldn't be. Hmm. I was in Bermuda one time, mm-hmm. and the, we went scuba, or not scuba diving, but snorkeling in this area in the Bermuda Triangle where all of these boats had been, like, had sunk. Ooh. So you could just see, like, you Ooh. know, the top little bits that were, like, rusted or whatever, but then you would kind of, like, put on your snorkel and, you know, look at, like, the rest of the ships below the water. I'm getting freaked out just thinking about it. <laughs> I just, it's the, the t- tip po- pointing out poking out if it's all underwater that's okay it's interesting but if it's poke oh can't do it that's why i'm so afraid of lakes though because it's lakes they're usually murkier and you can't see and it's like still water and they're full of just like secrets and things beneath the surface yeah but you can see the bottom no or you can't see the bottom of lake george you mm, not when you're swimming in it depends i mean if you're like in a foot off the shore you can but after that not really it's true yeah yeah the clarity of the lake varies greatly because it's so deep it yeah it did uh, it does get very very deep yes that it, freaks me out that freaks me out but you're okay with open ocean yes closed lakes very deep full of sunken things that freaks me out hmm. see that feels very contained the ocean's endless yeah That's great free- i want to be free i don't want to be f- in the freaking lake of doom i'll never find your body <laughs> great feed it to the kraken excellent segue here we go in 2013 japanese researchers captured footage of a giant squid on film for the very first time 
It's not surprising that something we've only been able to record as recently as 2013 inspired thousands of years of folklore and mythology. Pliny the Elder talks about this in his writings called Natural History. Who? Pliny the Elder. Pliny the Elder. We've talked about him before. We have? Yes. When? Oh, I think in the Crystal Ball episode, perhaps. Pliny the Elder? Maybe uh, some of the mythology stuff. Yeah. So this was first his his. Is book. he a friend of the pod? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. He could be evil. I don't know. Uh, his first book was published uh, in 77 AD called Natural History. So Pliny the Elder was an advisor for the Roman emperor at the time during the day, but he spent his nights writing. His natural history is one of the largest texts to have survived from the Roman Empire. So he's old. For 77 AD. <laughs> okay, very old. So our friend Kevin Murphy is going to help us out with a passage from natural history. At Cartia, in the preserves there, a polypus was in the habit of coming from the sea to the pickling tubs that were left open and devouring the fish laid in salt there. At last, by its repeated thefts and immoderate depredations, it drew down upon itself the wrath of the keepers of the works. Palisades were placed before them, but these the polypus managed to get over by the aid of a tree, and it was only caught at last by calling in the assistance of trained dogs, which surrounded it at night as it was returning to its prey, upon which the keepers, awakened by the noise, were struck with alarm at the novelty of the sight presented. First of all, the size of the polypus was enormous beyond all conception, and then it was covered all over with dried brine and exhaled a most dreadful stench. Who could have expected to find a polypus there, or could have recognized it as such under these circumstances? They really thought that they were joining battle with some monster, for at one instant it would drive off the dogs by its horrible fumes and lash at them with the extremities of its feelers, while at another it would strike them with its stronger arms, giving blows with so many clubs as it were, and it was only with the greatest difficulty that it could be dispatched with the aid of a considerable number of three-pronged fish spears. The head of this animal was shown to Lucullus. It was in size as large as a cask of fifteen amphorae, and had a beard, to use the expressions of Trebius himself, which could hardly be encircled with both arms, full of knots like those upon a club, and thirty feet in length. The suckers, or calicules, as large as an urn, resembled a basin in shape, while the teeth again were of a corresponding largeness. Its remains, which were carefully preserved as a curiosity, weighed seven hundred pounds. So, there you have a description of a sea monster from 77 AD. I was going to say, this sea monster could have met Jesus. No. But they, but they only last for a couple of years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And this one was a little sneaky. He would he would sneak out of the sea, come and eat his fish, and try to sneak back into the sea. Well, have you watched like the the like aquarium videos of like not of like octopi octopi or octopuses i think it's either i think it you're right it is either octopuses is the correct pluralization yes for in greek right and then octopi is like the latin or something i think it's the um, yeah the yeah the much more according to avi dobkin yeah Yes. Okay. Thank you. I was wondering where we got that information. <laughs> Anyways, so yeah, if you watched the the video of uh, of octopi, we're just gonna go with that because that's what we grew up sure. with. Climbing out of their tanks at night and just like going and doing all sorts of nefarious things and climbing back in. They get up to trouble. To, oh my gosh! There is this there is this one octopus that was just like absolutely notorious. I'm trying to remember which zoo it was, um, or aquarium rather, but. This 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 little little girl maybe uh -huh. was just like so nef mischievous. So she was for, first off very famous for holding grudges. Mm, she, a woman after my own heart. There was this one handler that she just did not like at all. And every time the handler would come by, she would go to the top of the tank and squirt water at him. <laughs> and like the handler went away for like months. And just like com comes back, it's been so long. Like for such a short lifespan creature, like that's an eternity. Right. And as soon as the the 
octopus sees this person and starts squirting water again. <laughs> also, this octopus, I don't know if it's the same one. I'm probably mixing up my octopus stories. Sure. There's an octopus that they couldn't figure out why things would be changing at night. They would leave things one way and then they'd come back in the morning and things would be different. Most notably, the lights would be on or off. Uh-huh. And there was this one octopus that absolutely hated the like the overhead lights. Yeah. And so at night, the octopus would remove the top of, remove the top of the tank, climb out across the room, get up to the light switch, sw- flip the switch because they figured out that's how you control the lights and then get back in their tank. <laughs> that's insane. That's so crazy to think about. I mean, that just that that's why I won't eat them. They're just too smart. Yeah. It's like eating a 3-year-old. <laughs> oh god. It's terrifying. Like think of think of a dog. Can a dog figure out a light switch? Maybe. Can figure out how to move it, sure, but can you really think they can figure out that the switch is actually controlling the lights? Yes. Absolutely. Out of their of their own volition. I think you can teach a dog to flip a light switch. I don't think they'll ever put two and two together. I of, think it depends on the dog. Sure. There's depth right. Okay. A cat. I think cats for sure. A lot smarter than dogs. You think cats are smarter than dogs? That's like a notorious fact, yes. There's no way you that's can't, true. You can't take your personal opinion here. There's no way that's true. Absolutely. Okay, we're going to put a cat, a dog, and an octopus in a big tank. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, let's and, get back on track and here. And film a sitcom. Okay. What well, What is really believed to be the root of the Kraken stories is many different things, right? But definitely the giant squid. And just to reiterate, the giant squid was or in the colossal squid were not filmed until 2013 they were not recorded in any way there's no like eyes on them right as a as, as a living creature until 2013 so if we look back at this quote from 77 AD this whole period of time up until 2013 there was like a lot of mis- mystery still you know around these huge sea creatures totally so it makes sense just to kind of like set the scene right that there's such folklore around them because they've been so like hard to document and to understand and study. Mm -hmm. Did you know we know less about the oceans on earth than we know about the solar system? I I, I was very aware of this fact simply because they love bringing it up in almost every single sci-fi novel once they go out into space. (laughs) I just think it's so interesting that it is easier to put a human being on the moon than at the bottom of the ocean. Yeah, absolutely. It's a weird little uh, landscape down there. It's like the it's like a bizarro world. Have you seen the abyss? No. Rumors and sightings of antiquity developed into folklore of the kraken. The kraken is a mythical creature from Norse and Scandinavian legend. It's known to live off the coast of Norway and Greenland, and it feeds off of sailors. It has the power to take down ships, create whirlpools and do just about anything in its power to get delicious humans off of their boat and into its mouth. The entomology is fascinating. So kraken is derived from the Norse and Swedish words kraki and crack, meaning something twisted, an unhealthy animal. I thought it meant crooked. In German, crack or kraken means octopus. Oh. Kraken is also an ancient uh, Norwegian word for octopus. And there's an old euphemism in Sweden meaning whales. So this was used in place of the original word that grew to be taboo because it was believed that you could summon a whale by saying its name. You can summon a whale by saying its name? That was this old like Swedish folklore. So but So they developed like an alternate name to say to refer to whales without summoning them. Oh, why does this sound so familiar? Where, where, where is where's it from? Sweden. Oh, wow, gosh, this sounds so familiar. Of course. It's Moby Dick. Oh. <laughs> It's always Moby Dick. It's always Moby Dick. Yeah, that's just, we're, yeah, we're talking whale facts, and it's in one of the 10,000 whale facts chapters where they just talk about this fact. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can't say a whale's true name because then you're fucked. That fact, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Kongus Skugsa, or Kingsmere, is an old Norse text from 1250 AD. It was originally intended to be educational materials for King Magnus Lagabot. And in this text is where we first see the written mention of the Kraken. So 1250 AD, we first see the written mention of the Kraken. Mm. He warns sailors 
that there is a massive tentacle monster that swims off the coast of Norway, Greenland, and Iceland. This is the region of the world that heavily relied and still does on the ocean for trade, travel, and food. It's very reasonable to be like ridiculously scared of any kind of large sea creature you know, during this time. Because A, boats were so much smaller. They relied primarily on oars. So you're like right at the waterline, mm-hmm. you know? And if you're right, just looking over the edge of a boat and there's a big red tentacle, like, oh, f- screw that, man. Screw that, man, definitely. By the 1700s, belief in the Kraken was commonplace in the northern regions of the world. According to Ars Technica, writers like the physician Christian Francis Paulinus repeated stories about the Kraken uncritically. So quoting here, a monstrous animal which occasionally rose from the sea on the coast of Lapland and Finnmark, and which was of such an enormous dimension that a regiment of soldiers could conveniently maneuver on its back. From the 1883 book Sea Monsters Unmasked by Henry Lee. That's cool. Yeah. In the 1750s, someone called Eric Pontopidan, <laughs> the Bishop of Bergen, wrote and widely distributed an account of the Kraken. So, 1750s, we have the Bishop of Bergen, who was a big political figure in Norway, distribute uh, a pamphlet on the Kraken with a first-hand account. And this really kicked the Kraken fear to the next level. Take it away, Kevin. The Norwegian fishermen sometimes find unexpected shallows when a short distance out at sea, the depth suddenly diminishing from 100 fathoms to 20 or 30, wrote Pon Papadon, according to a late 19th century English translation. Then they know that the kraken is rising, and immediately retreat. His back first appears looking like a number of small islands. His arms rise above the surface like the masts of a vessel, and are said to have the power to grasp the largest man of war and pull it to the bottom. After this, we see mentions of the kraken in classic literature and fiction. Most notably, of course, Jules Verne, Alfred Tennyson, and Victor Hugo. So Victor Hugo and I actually have something in common, which is that we both hate the tentacles. He also (laughs) hates the tentacles. Okay, that's cool. So he wrote a novel called The Toilers of the Sea, which was published in 1866. What did you say, The Toilets of the Sea? (laughs) The sea is the toilet of the world, no? That's dark. (laughs) So in this book, one of the characters is trapped by a giant octopus-like creature, and it almost kills him. Trapped where? Like, it, it kind of, like, it gives him a big hug. Like, it, kind of, like, is attacking him. Can he breathe underwater? No, they're in the shore. Oh, so he... He's, like, pinned down by this. Got it. Yeah. Okay, he's on land, sort of. Right, he's standing, yeah. Yeah. So Hugo writes an entire chapter, which does not align with the plot in any way, where he scorns all tentacled creatures and calls them devilfish. So he, he has a novel... There's a chapter where this guy gets attacked by an octopus. Then Hugo pauses the book to have a chapter on devil fish and tentacles. And then he resumes the novel again after. We got to read this book. (laughs) So in this chapter, he also mentions what ancient legends call the Kraken glutinous masses endowed with a malignant will. He also attests that they can suck blood with their tentacles. (laughs) And he goes on to say, quoting, Claws are harmless compared to the horrible action of these natural cupping glasses. The talons of the wild beasts enter into your flesh, but with the cephalopod, it is you who enters into the creature. I mean, I can see the similarities between a a tentacle and a leech. You know, they're all Mm -hmm. sucky, sucky. They latch on. They're slimy super flexible put your hand away i'm waggling (laughs) oh my god yeah you know and oh what was the um, trying to think of what the what the vampire movie was oh it wasn't a movie at all it was um morbius from spider-man okay he was a vampire that uh they never said the word blood they only said plasma Mm -hmm. well he fed on plasma (laughs) And his hands basically had like little leech suction cups. Yuck. And so he would just like grab people and it would, you know, look like they're just being drained. But he was like literally sucking out their blood. Dark. 
Morbius has come up multiple times. Yeah, now I know who he is, even though I've never encountered you've him never in the met. wild. No, yeah, we've never met. Alfred Tennyson was only 21 in 1830 when he wrote of the great and terrifying Kraken. Below the thunders of the upper deep, far, far beneath in the abysmal sea, his ancient, dreamless, uninvaded sleep the Kraken sleepeth. Faint as sunlights flee about his shadowy sides, above him swell huge sponges of millennial growth and height. And far away into the sickly light, from many a wondrous and secret cell, unnumbered and enormous polypi winnow with giant arms the lumbering green. There hath he lain for ages, and will lie battening upon huge sea worms in his sleep, until the latter fire shall heat the deep. Then once by man and angels to be seen, in roaring he shall rise and on the surface die. That's scary. It's very scary now. And of course, in Jules Verne's infamous novel, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea from 1870, we have another quote. When it is a question of monsters, the imagination is apt to run wild. Not only is it supposed that these polyps can draw down vessels, but a certain Ulaus Magnus speaks of a cephalopod a mile long that is more like an island than an animal. It is also said that the Bishop of Nidros was building an altar on an immense rock. Mass finished, the rock began to walk and return to the sea. The rock was a polyp. Another bishop, Pontopodon, speaks also of a polyp on which a regiment of cavalry could maneuver. Lastly, the ancient naturalists speak of monsters whose mouths were like gulfs and which were too large to pass through the Straits of Gibraltar. But how much is true of these stories? asked Conseil. Nothing, my friends. At least of that which passes the limit of truth to get to fable or legend. Nevertheless, there must be some ground for the imagination of the storytellers. I do think it's interesting that which is, I guess, not different from other things that we've done. But the history of the Kraken is really rooted in literature and fiction. So we've obviously included a lot of quotes here, read wonderfully by Kevin Murphy. But I think it does illustrate maybe in a way more so than some other things, some other horror topics, uh, how much the line between fiction, right? Literature, fiction, and real account sort of started to bleed in this er time. You know what I'm saying? Well, I feel that unlike werewolves or vampires or something, yeah, it's not steeped in evil or religious fervor or something like that. There's no curses involved. There, there's no aspect of humanity in these creatures. These are simply beasts that under no circumstance could be disproved. You know, you, to this day, you still have people out there looking for Bigfoot. Right. You know, and meanwhile, you have all of these actual accounts of sailors saying, I saw this thing and actual tangible evidence of their existence. We, we talked about whales earlier. One of the huge contributing factors to Kraken myths and of just enormous tentacled sea beasts was from whaling because they would haul in these sperm whales that had these scars from these like crazy battles with some kind of enormous tentacled beast. And, oh. you know, because whales come to the surface, but sperm whales dive so deep. Like, uh, to this day, humans have not seen sperm whales feed in their natural like habitat. Mm -hmm. Just because it happens so ridiculously deep. So, but when they come back to the surface, obviously they're hunted or they were hunted and they just bear these marks of, you know, f 50 meter long tentacles, totally making up a number there. But the, the imagination is going to run wild. Like what kind of creature caused this in the first place? You know, also it's like, I guess sperm whales eat giant squids, but that, and that's kind of cool. It also makes sense because giant squids are usually found at very, very, very great depths. Exactly. So, and the only time you're going to encounter something is usually when it dies and floats the surface. Yeah, it's interesting. It's also, it makes sense because 
in these countries, right, specifically in Scandinavia, I mean everywhere, but it's very cold. The water, the seas are rough, but the sea is a huge part of their life, right, Mm -hmm. with trade and and getting food and all these things. And so there's all these ships, there's ship culture there, right? Lots of ships coming and going, and and it's rough northern seas, like, you know. Hashtag, Hashtag sea life. Hashtag sea life. So... You know what I mean? There's a lot of, uh, you can understand why some, like a combination of seeing some things that you don't really understand, like with the whales and with, and with octopi and other things like that, seeing those things and then having these, these enduring myths from, you know, 77 AD that are not only in literature and fiction, but also in your like local legend, how it just keeps getting solidified and solidified. You're going to have, you know, everyone in the port town and the ship comes back and everyone's at the pu- at the pub or the ta- the mead hall or whatever it is. Sure. And, you know, you got uh, o- Olaf there saying, hey, I just saw a Kraken. And, this, you know, no one can say like, hey, you're you're wrong. Right. This is perfectly plausible, A, because of the proof and B, because you can't disprove it. Meanwhile, you got the guy like, "Hey, my 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 buddy Hank is a is a vampire." It's like, well, <laughs> we'll just go ask him, you know? <laughs> uh huh. Sure. Can't go ask the Kraken. It also, you're right. I actually think that's cool. It is. It's almost like Lord of the Rings, where you Why? go out onto a big journey. You're leaving home, and you're taking like the stories back. The same with thing with with all sea stories, right? With all sea legends. But it's not like, oh, everybody's on the sea. It's like, no, sailors are out. They have these adventures and legends, and and then it, the oral, I guess, like tradition, right, of story, is amplified here because there's less firsthand accounts of it. Right, and these sailors were the first people to just actually disseminate these things around the world. Right. So you know, I don't know how long these Scandinavian sailing ventures went for, but you know, fast forward hundreds of years, and like. When people just went on these sailing ventures to go whaling, that was like a three-year contract, which is crazy. And you know what? Honestly, if I was like a whaler or something back then, Mm -hmm. it would be like a very good move to to go out onto my mission, come home after my three years, be at the tavern, and be like, you guys... My life is so dangerous and cool and adventurous, and I'm so mysterious and sexy. Like, come listen to my Kraken story. I mean, you have all of your, well, not not barmaids, bar, bar, barmen, and maids, and maids that are swooning, swooning, and you got all the kids on your knee, yeah, being being like, Cap Captain Abby, (laughs) Cabby, Cabby. T- tell tell us about the tentacles again. Yeah, and I'll and every time I'll, get... I'll lie more and more. There was a there was six of them. <laughs> exactly. So like you know, I'm into that. I respect that. Yep. Uh, it's literally the big fish story gets a little bit bigger every time. Right. Yeah. But, and again, you just can't disprove it. It's like, uh, excuse me, we're gonna go measure this this giant sea monster. Please, please bring him here. It's also easy to to not only to not disprove it, but to, you know, even if other sailors don't see it, it's like, well, the ocean is so huge and unknown. It's just like it lends itself so well to this sort of mythology. Right. I mean, absolutely. It's there could there could still and I, that I actually like I believe after doing this research, like when you find out how recent we really like have learned about a lot of these huge giant creatures that live in the deep, deep, deep sea. You're like, holy shit, I bet there is more shit down there. Totally. There, you, there's a whole ecosphere of enormous things. Or right. size doesn't even matter. There's a whole ecosphere of a m- huge variety in, of size of creatures live beneath the, the level where light penetrates the water. So you can't even just drop cameras down and find out what's going on. Because you can't see anything. It's completely dark. There is no light and you can't even bring your own lights because it messes up everything. Yeah, exactly. And we're going to get into that. So just to close out on the history side before we move into some of the modern stuff. Oh, right. By 1874, the Kraken legend was subjected to more critical review 
in a publication called the Popular Science Review. So it's in 1874 that we're starting to get a little bit of uh, questioning. That some people are coming back from the bar getting a little too cocky. And the scientists of the town are like, hey, Listen, I call bullshit. <laughs> we're calling. We just spent all afternoon talking to Hank's friend, and he's not a vampire. <laughs> <laughs> so the writer W. Seville Kent went in on many of the accounts in fictionalized stories that we've covered today. He personally called out Pliny the Elder, which is a bold move. That's a personal affront. Yeah. Pliny is. Huge again. Pliny was a fun guy. Don't don't go after friends of the pod. <laughs> so here's a quote from W. Seville Kent himself disparaging our dear friend Pliny. Okay, so this is some anti Pliny propaganda. That's right. Anti Pliny, anti Kraken. From time immemorial, tradition has assigned to certain members of this Calamari tribe proportions so far exceeding those of any authenticated representative of the invertebrata, or indeed, with the exception of the whales, of the whole animal kingdom, that little or no credence in their existence has been placed by modern men of science. Fuck you, Auntie Pliny. <laughs> Fuck you, W. Seville Kent. This, this entire podcast is now dedicated to disproving Mr. Kent. By proving that Krakens exist? By supporting anything Pliny says. <laughs> what if Pliny was awful? We need to check into this before we make statements like yeah, that. Yeah, he's going to be horrendously racist or something. Yeah, we got to we gotta be sure. You he's, can't just come out in support of any old ancient white man. Probably a flat earther, too. <laughs> Definitely was. Krakens had the big tentacles because they had to hang on to the edge of the earth. <laughs> <laughs> They, they would snatch the fish as they fell off. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. Well, okay. So I don't want to get into flat earth things, but I'm, what do they believe? What's the end of the world then? It's just like a piece of paper and then what things fall off into space? Is that what they believe? That is so stupid. Why would you think that? <laughs> well, tell me. I don't know. I'm so glad you asked, Abby, because I can't disclose any details yet without okay. proper authorization. Sure. But there may or may not be a new movie in the works that has a lot to do with Flat Earth theory. Sure. Mm -hmm. And all of my knowledge comes simply from reading the script. Okay. And which is just people talk about it in the script. Uh huh. So two theories. I mean, there's many theories. But one is that the whole world is surrounded by Antarctica. Antarctica is a giant ring around the edge of the world, right? And then there's, so there's just like ice mountains everywhere. But then what's on the other side of that? It's a dome. We're a dome in space. Okay, that doesn't make sense, but sure. Also, there's Pac-Man theory. Wait, so is there, is the, we're a dome. Okay, what's Pac-Man theory? Pac-Man theory is way cooler. Where, just like in the video game Pac-Man, when you go... From one edge of the screen, you immediately appear on the other. Oh, yeah. I remember that from the script as well. That is cool. That'd be convenient. be a lot easier to travel. Also, exactly what happens when traveling on a sphere. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. <laughs> the ocean is a massively powerful and still somewhat unknown entity. The giant squid and the colossal squid are real animals that can be found in every single ocean on Earth. So not just northern oceans, every single ocean on Earth. Giant and colossal squid exist. Wow. The current record for a colossal squid is 49 feet long, weighing over a thousand pounds, and it was the size of a semi-trailer. Oh, that's the record of their length. Of, yeah, their size. I was like, record for, well, like the fucking squid long jump? Like, what? <laughs> no, the record of their size. That's the biggest one we got, we've got proof of. Got it. And I've, in that, but it's so hard to even find these animals. Right. So it's also possible that in these early ages, right, before all of the pollution and shit drove them farther away. I mean, I'm not a scientist. This is totally made up. This is like Flat Earth 101. That they could have been more close to humanity, right? Like that, they, that well, like what if a thousand pound colossal squid washed to shore in 77 AD? Like that's totally possible. We're also saying by 
walking 10 feet into the jungle, we have effectively measured every single tiger that we've seen. And right. the biggest tiger we've seen by walking 10 feet into the jungle is this. Right. Obviously, there's bigger fucking tigers in there. Well, maybe. Unless you get really, really lucky. Well, yeah, but exactly. That's a very good point. So also, I didn't realize this. This this giant squid that they found that has set the record, right? Yeah. Not only does it have suckers, of course, but it has barbed hooks on its tentacles. Interesting. Oh, you know, that makes sense. I always wondered why the sperm whales have scars from battles with squids. Those barbed hooks. Because I'm like, okay, yeah. So it's like a bunch of suction cups. Like it leaves. We've all gotten suction cups. Have know? we? Yeah. You know, the, su- <laughs> the suction cups. You know, <laughs> it, it, it leaves a mark for a bit. It doesn't leave a scar. Like I can, obviously the beak would leave a scar. But that makes sense. If they're all barbed, that's terrifying. Yeah. And they've only been observed in their natural habitat a few times. Mostly we know about them due to sailors finding carcasses as they wash ashore. Right. So why are they so elusive, you may ask? Because they're shy. Because of their giant eyes. The biggest eyes, in fact, in the animal kingdom. Oh. Because it is so, so, so dark, 2,000 feet below the ocean surface, absolutely no light is there, these colossal squid have developed insanely large eyes that would not be able to handle sunlight very well at all. Each eye has been compared to the size of a basketball, three times bigger than any other creature's eyes that we know, according to LiveScience.com. Cool. Yes. It's honestly impressive that they have eyes at all. Mm-hmm. Like, why? I mean, I guess why? Because they see with a little bit of light. Yeah. But you'd think you, they, they'd be like dolphins or something and have sonar or something that like lets you hunt without light. Yeah. It's interesting. Live science also speculates that they would be very sensitive to the bright lights that researchers often attach to their cameras in order to record in a deep sea which would discourage the animals from coming near. The recordings that we do have are mostly due to uh, very dim red lights that do not bother the colorblind deep sea creatures as much as the usual sea recording equipment. Mm -hmm. So a few years ago in 2013, when they finally made these breakthroughs, they kind of figured out what was going on and they used like amber, almost like dark room lights instead of, you know, just like regular underwater lights and those don't seem to uh, bother them as much. The footage that I think you're referring to, unless I'm just confused, were these like deep sea researchers? Yeah. Okay. So there was other footage that just like went viral. There's been a few. It was like around the same year. There was like a few different breakthroughs with it. Right. Because climate change probably. But it was from an oil rig. Mm-hmm. Obviously a deep sea offshore oil rig. Uh and, you know, they have cameras down there just for maintenance purposes. And there was just a crazy giant squid that just like floated on past. Yeah. It's you can obviously on YouTube look up all of these videos and it's if you're not afraid of tentacles, they're cool. They kind of freak me out a little bit. There's so many different types of giant squid, too. Like what what you picture of like the big girthy tentacles. Girthy. Girthy tentacle. Like mm-hmm. I, I don't picture that. I, I picture octopus with big tentacles and squids with uh very long thin ones and the big weird long cone-shaped head yeah i mean which is far more accurate Mm. i guess i'm just picturing like the twenty thousand leagues under the sea sure sure yeah giant squid yeah which is like the combination of everything yeah but yeah like what to, to your point they get like the the ones where like the body is like super small Super small, still like the size of a bathtub. Yeah. And then the tentacles are like 50 feet long after that. Yeah. It's but almost like the jellyfish. You they know? look, yeah, yeah, they look like jellyfish. They're yeah. So spooky. Oh, oh, spooky. Did I tell you? I don't know. I, I didn't mention this yet today, but one of my earliest memories, which I know is wrong, <laughs> is being in uh, my first house in the bathtub and, and seeing tentacles come out of the ceiling. Oh, yeah. And I know that that didn't happen. And I wrote a story about it. But I remember that we read on the shot on the podcast. Yeah. Uh, Obviously, it didn't happen, but it's like such a vivid memory in my brain. It's similar to me in the 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 middle of the ocean. Right. When when, when would I be in the middle of the ocean with no boat? With a huge, huge sunken ship. Yeah. Yeah. Oof. Oof. 
Despite the unsettling appearance of these massive squid, they are not known to attack ships or people. Though there are early encounters from sailors of attacks with sea creatures, right? But most modern scholars think that they were actually mistakenly referring to whales who had attacked the boats. Mm. I feel like a whale is going to be so much more aggressive than a giant squid when we're talking about the surface. Yeah. The only reason these squids are going to get aggressive is like when you're hunting them. Right. Yeah. Looking at you, whales. Looking at you, whales. (laughs) There is a bit of crack and pop culture we can get into, in addition to obviously the literary stuff that we've talked about. So you're probably familiar with the with the phrase, release the kraken. Never heard it. Really? Yeah. So not only was this a uh, um, catchphrase for voting conspiracy theories I last year. I am familiar with release the okay. kraken. Please. Which I, I don't want to get into the conspiracy theories, but. Yeah, nothing about conspiracy theories. These are all facts. Right. But the election was real. So let's all move on. So in 1981, a movie came out called The Clash of the Titans. You don't say. Which was loosely based on the, Greek, on the Greek myth of Perseus. And there's also a 2010 remake. And in here, they say, release the Kraken. Which well, is, was, is a very weird representation of a Kraken. And it's not... Uh, well, hang on. They say release the Kraken in the 2010 version. They say it in both. They say a different phrasing in the two, in the 81 version. What do they say? It's like, bring out the Kraken. Okay. It's something that doesn't have the same ring to it. There's also a few other Greek-themed movies, right, with the Kraken. There's Wrath of the Titans from 2012, and there's Troy the Odyssey from 2017, which you can actually watch on Tubi if you would like. And you may be wondering, like I was, how the Kraken, which is a Norse Scandinavian mythical creature got into these films about Greek mythology. And I found a Film School Rejects article by Kevin Carr, which analyzes exactly this. And it talks about how accurate and inaccurate the Clash of the Titans' use of mythology is. And Carr determines that it's about 50% accurate. Can I, can I just guess? The, off my own assumptions, because I really thought that the Kraken was from Greek myth. But it turns out, it's that's solely because I was familiar with Clash of the Titans. There you go. Um, because when what I'm trying to think of where the myth of Perseus comes from, um, or like where I read it. But anyways, like yeah, when he's like freeing, is it Andromeda? Not Andromeda. He does well. Someone else frees Andromeda. Who's he rescuing? Anyways, well yeah, when Perseus has to like fight the sea monster. Uh, it's originally Cetus, who is not supposed to be a giant tentacle beast. It's, it's supposed to be just like a giant sea serpent whale thing. Gotcha. That creates whirlpools. Interesting. Because they always create whirlpools. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so the exactly what I was just about to say. The filmmakers swapped in the Kraken for what was originally Cetus, which was a whale-like sea monster. Which is ha- is where we get our whale classification of cetacean there you go the article also gave the filmmakers some flack for making the kraken appear like a humanoid with a face and arms versus the tentacle monster that we know and love they fortunately corrected for the 2010 remake but you can google it on your youtube it and it literally looks like godzilla meets the kraken it's so silly look godzilla meets the kraken would be a killer movie <laughs> yeah uh, okay, so there's also a few other movies, a few other Kraken, Kraken joints if you want to get into it. Sorry, you got you can't just softball in Godzilla versus the Kraken without me saying how cool it would be if Godzilla teamed up with the Kraken to fight monsters and the Kraken would like wrap around him as like a little backpack of like tentacles, be the, like the, the crack back. <laughs> God. Oh man, if your brain... Move that quickly for other things and not just it'd be like Dr. Jokes. Octopus from Spider Man, uh huh. But Godzilla, it's like the best of both worlds. There you go. A lot of the the other what are they called? <laughs> kaiju, a lot of the other kaiju are sea proficient. I feel like they can all swim. Well, that's because they need to put them somewhere, you know, mm-hmm. and they usually just have them coming out of the ocean. Also, most of kaiju, even the word, is japanese and so the only like coming out of this like being it's an island culture you know so uh everything coming out of the sea 
would make sense. Sure. Yeah. If if kaijus came from Saudi Arabia, they'd be rising out of the sand. Right. Interesting. Oh, we got to look into that. There's got to be sand monsters. Oh, sure. So we also have Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man's Chest, which, roll your eyes all you want, is actually one of the more accurate depictions of a kraken. Do you see these eyes rolling? I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to I the people. I love that movie. I know that you do. I'm talking to everybody else. Okay. We also have Kraken Tentacles of the Deep from 2016, which you can watch on Tubi as well for free with ads. This is not an ad for Tubi. I'm just Will trying to tell it? you where to watch Tubi, them. unless you're sponsoring us. Scratch. Yeah, scratch off. <laughs> we also have Eye of the Beast from 2017, which is on a competitor of Tubi, Pluto TV. We have The Monster That Changed the World from 1957. We have Octopus 2 River of Fear from 21, which is on Tubi. This sounds amazing. Where where were this list of movies when we were trying to figure out what to watch the other day? I, well, I told you I had it. And then we have the movie we did watch from 1988, Deep Rising. What a film. Which we watched on Amazon for a fee. <laughs> <laughs> if you or a loved one would like a crack in pricing guide, <laughs> just contact Abby at Films About Lunatics. What did you think of Deep Rising? One of the best pieces of cinema ever made. <laughs> Are you being sarcastic? No, it's an incredible film. I mean, I don't know that I would say it's an incredible film. I thought it was a fun, outdated action movie. <laughs> it's no Titanic. Pota potato, potato. It's no Silence of the Lambs. So it, interestingly, in, interesting you brought up Titanic because they came out at the exact same time and they had to compete against each other. And both are movies about a sinking cruise ship. They had very different budgets. Slightly different budgets, slightly different levels of Leonardo DiCaprio. But <laughs> one had a Kraken. If yeah. you put a Kraken in Titanic, now you're talking the best movie of all time. <laughs> Isn't it already technically? I mean, it's famous, but it doesn't hit all the notes. Because, what, there's no Kraken? Okay. So you have Titanic going down, right? You have all this drama, action, love story. It's like, it's a great film. Yeah. You mix in a Kraken fighting Godzilla at the same <laughs> time, and you just mass appeal to every audience. There's not a single person that wouldn't watch that film. All right. We'll have to pitch it to somebody. Titanic. A remix. Titanic remix. Titanic 2. Oh, which has actually already been made. Still Kraken. Still Kraken. <laughs> the, cra the Kraken brings the Titanic to the surface. Godzilla says, this is stupid. Put it back. <laughs> Conflict ensues. <laughs> so, okay, back to Deep Rising now. This was interesting because I thought that like, like uh, we've experienced on many different monster movies as we've been doing research we go in with an expectation of the monster is going to be like this and then we find out that the filmmakers took a lot of different liberties and it it's not the beast that you know and love uh and at first first off we're going to give we're not going to give any spoilers about this movie um because i i hate that and we're also going to do a horror movie club on it for patreon so if okay. you want an even deeper analysis of this movie july will release uh, a, a comparison between this and another movie we're watching for the next episode good so what i will say is that i thought a lot of liberties were taken but especially hearing uh, a lot of the historical depictions of krakens uh, such as like the barbed suckers and things like that yeah uh which sorry historical depictions like th these are just squid facts sure you know uh, Squid facts with Alan Kudan. Like a lot in the the way that like an octopus figures out puzzles and crevices and like slithers through things to find food. Yeah. Like it all kind of makes sense. I mean, obviously some, li some egregious liberties were taken as well. But overall, I, I thought it was a really fun film that it's just like it's a total beer and popcorn movie. Yeah, for sure. I agree. Definitely something to check out. And... You get to watch Benny from The Mummy. Oh, yeah, Benny. I want to watch all of his movies. He's the same character as he is in The Mummy. 
Uh, it's oh, uh, same director as the yeah, mummy, yeah, 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 who just keeps casting Benny in all of his films. Apparently, so good. Uh, you can actually go. I, I did a little research after the movie finished, and like, he just keeps working with this guy. Cool. And keeps making him the same character. I want to have a marathon one day where we watch all of the movies that Benny is in. Yeah, I wish we knew his actor name, but we don't. We don't off the top of our heads, but but everyone knows Benny from the Mummy. Yeah, Benny, Benny from the Mummy. You can Google it. And that brings us uh, with with Benny from the Mummy. That brings us to the end of our deep dive, if you will, into Krakens. Very good into the Kraken because the the it is the Kraken, not Krakens. Right. It is what, believed to be one mythological creature, not a race of creatures, or S- not a species. I similar say. to uh, the the what is it? The Seattle team, the Seattle hockey team, the Seattle Kraken. It's uh-huh. not the Krakens. Right. It's just the Seattle Kraken. Right. They are Kraken. So we have a Lunatics Library episode coming next week with some really cool Kraken stories. Something written by a very good friend of ours, which we're so excited to share with you. It's so good. And a story recorded by our near and dear friend Bob Don, which is a really cool uh, public domain take on a Kraken story. And a little bit unexpected, I would say. Can't wait. So thank you so much for being here and we will talk to you next week. In the meantime, stay safe and stay on land. Stay on stay away from the shore. All we can do is warn you. Bye. <laughs>If you want to support the Lunatics Radio Hour podcast, consider joining our Patreon. For as little as $1 a month, you get access to bonus episodes, access to Lunatics Magazine, and all kinds of other fun perks. You can also support the show by picking up some of our really cool, fun new merch featuring gorgeous designs by Pilar Keperta. That's available on Teespring, and you can follow the link in the show notes to find that. And one of the most important things you can do to help small podcasts like us grow is is to rate and review on Apple or anywhere else you listen to the Lunatics Radio Hour. Every review really does go such a long way. And of course, you can follow us at The Lunatics Project on Instagram. Thank you.